We are rapidly approaching daybreak on this Friday across Queensland, and all eyes continue to focus on what is now Category 5 Severe Cyclone Marsha, and Marsha has been making a turn more toward the south over the last six hours. We're still expecting landfall between 9 and 10 a.m. local time, but the far-reaching effects of this cyclone are already impacting this area. Interestingly, we are still receiving weather reports from Percy Island, which is the island that is going through the western eye wall of this dangerous cyclone. It should be noted that that western eye wall has not been quite as strong as the eastern fringe of the inner core based on enhanced satellite imagery. Nonetheless, they still received wind gusts in excess of 200 kilometers per hour, and you can see that they met that benchmark quite a few times. And that is, once again, despite the fact that they have missed the strongest part of the storm, which is passing just east of the island, along with the eye, you can see that the minimum central pressure only made it down to about 971 hectopascals, whereas the minimum estimated central pressure, as per the Bureau of Meteorology, is down to 929. So once the storm makes a direct landfall farther south, maximum winds and sustained wind gusts will be even higher. The zoomed-in enhanced infrared clearly shows the western eye wall raking the islands here just to the west, but the center is now moving almost due south. Now this is some very good news for portions of the Queensland coast, most notably Mackay. You can see that the inner core where you see these deep reds and even dark grayish colors are passing well to the east and southeast of Mackay. So at this point, whatever weather you've already experienced with this cyclone is about as bad as it's going to get because the inner core is now starting to move away. I wish I could say the same for areas farther south, but this is around the time where conditions are really going to be going downhill over the next six hours, well in advance of the eye actually crossing the coastline. And as I stated in the previous video, it's going to be these bays and inlets where the maximum sea level water rise is going to be most prominent, as this will be the area where the topography and the landscape and the overall just shape of the coastline along with those strong southerly winds on the east side of the eye wall this is going to be your prime time area for storm surge inundation now luckily for st lawrence with this more southerly track that has taken place within the last three to six hours the bureau of meteorology has shifted their forecast a little bit toward the east so you may start to see more in the way of offshore winds which will help to offset some of that sea level, sea level water rise. But I still recommend that you stay away from the coastline all the way through the time that the center passes to your southeast just to be on the safe side. But if you're anywhere to the east and especially to the north of Yapoon, this is going to be the time to get the heck away from the coast. You do not want to be anywhere near the sea as this eye starts to move towards your area. To make matters worse, this is the tide chart for the area that is going to be most affected, the area near Marquise Island, and luckily not too many people live in this area, but nonetheless, the storm is going to be making landfall shortly before high tide, which is not going to make the storm surge any less. Now this microwave satellite imagery is now a few hours old, but it still drives home the main point I'm trying to make, that Cyclone Marsha is relatively small in size, so areas that do not receive the direct inner core or eye wall surrounding the eye will not receive winds or storm surge nearly as high as those that the center is going to pass directly over. In terms of the current intensity of the storm, we do not have any reconnaissance aircraft data in the South Pacific Basin, so the best thing that we have to go by are satellite estimates, and the satellite estimates are also classified based on the Dvorak scale. And basically, the easiest way to remember this is the higher the T number, the stronger the storm is estimated to be. You can see as we go on in time here, the fixes have continued to increase with the T number now of 6.5. And as we turn to the scale, a 6.5 gives a maximum sustained wind value. And again, these are in one minute sustained winds, sustained winds of 127 knots. And as we look at the kilometers, you're looking at 235 kilometers. The category scale is based on the Atlantic Hurricane Scale, so this would be a high-end Category 4 if this cyclone were taking place. So this easily fits the Bureau's criteria of a severe Category 5 on Australia's scale. Now the overall impacts right along the coast farther south become much more complicated to forecast because it still looks as though the eye is going to be moving inland as it parallels the coastline. Therefore, we are expecting some rather significant weakening over the next 12 hours. But despite that, the eastern inner core is still likely to hang partially off the coastline. Therefore, interest near Yapoon, Keppel Bay, and even Curtis Island, you can still expect significant sea level water rise. And I, I would still take all precautionary measures to get out of that area as much as possible. At least seek some higher ground, 
a little bit inland. You're still going to be inundated by rather strong winds despite the center crossing the coastline and some rapid weakening taking place, but at least you're going to be away from the main storm surge zone. Now as we turn once again back to the latest tropical cyclone forecast track map from the Bureau, you can see that again significant weakening is expected as the center begins to make its closest approach to Rockhampton and Gladstone, but we're still looking at a hefty category 2 with very strong winds exceeding gale force right along the coast with heavy rain and strong squalls still moving throughout the inland portions. As we mentioned in the prior video, Cyclone Marsha is well embedded within a very strong southerly steering flow, so the overall motion of the storm is not expected to really slow down. If anything, it may even start to speed up over the next 24 hours. So although inland flooding from precipitation will be a concern, it won't be quite as significant as we could oftentimes see with a landfalling tropical cyclone. We're looking at total precip amounts roughly between 150 and 250 millimeters. So certainly some hefty rainfall, but maybe not quite as bad as we've seen in Queensland in the past. That wraps up your Friday morning update on severe tropical cyclone Marsha. Please stick with 28storms.com along with us on Facebook and Twitter for more rapid and supplemental updates. And of course, for the official information, please continue to refer to Australia's Bureau of Meteorology.